She is a clinical and forensic psychologist. She's worked within the walls of prisons for 10 years. She's just an incredible young lady. And I just wanted to welcome Dr. Leslie Dobson to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Dr. Leslie, you have quite the amazing uh, experience in life. You've overcome a lot. You have come a long way, but let's start from the very, very beginning. Where did you grow up? Where are you originally from? I was actually born in Canada. Oh. And I'm still not sure when, but we immigrated to California when I was very, very, very young. Uh, and I spent most of my youth in Orange County, California. Oh, very cool. I lived in LA for about 14 years. I used to get down to Orange County often. <laughs> It's a lovely yeah. area to be from. <laughs> it is. Um, given the choice, when I turned 18, I definitely left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go explore um, a little bit more of the world. <laughs> yes. I was very aware of the uh, what we call the orange veil that people oh. in Orange County have. Uh, <laughs> but once I traveled the world and became educated, I chose to return and bring my groundedness and my values back to this beautiful area and beautiful climate and raise my kids here. Oh, I love that. And your kids get the benefit of you having that experience. Yes. Yes. Cool. Because it is easy to be very superficial and sucked into the <laughs> Southern California lifestyle that the rest of the world finds very entertaining. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so what made you want to get into clinical and forensic psychology? I've always found it fascinating. Um, I originally wanted to be a veterinarian and I was in one of my veterinary classes and the professor said, you know, look to the left, look to the right. Those people won't be there at the end of this course because it is so difficult. And it made me really question, do I love science? What is it that I'm chasing? Uh, and we had to choose a bunch of different classes at Colorado State where I started. And I started a psychology class and I thought, wow, this doesn't feel difficult at all. This is already how I think. Uh, I find this entertaining. I was really interested. I wanted to study and read and engage. And from there, it just snowballed into this crazy career of forensic psychology. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I, I love that. And I know you had to overcome a lot of stuff to be able to get to where you're at now. What kind of traumas and experiences did you have to overcome? Definitely a lot. I've, there, you know, there's personal traumas and there's professional traumas. Um, I didn't have the best childhood. I had quite a difficult childhood with parents, parent, a parental divorce, um, moving a lot. Uh, but when I started in my career, I chose some of the most dangerous settings to work in. And I didn't even understand trauma until I was, one, hearing the stories of people who had been seriously traumatized in prisons and jails and uh, their upbringings, but also firsthand exposure to violence every single day and feeling that I was stuck in these secure settings without control of the doors, surrounded by inmates or violent patients. Uh, and I was, I had no authority. I was a visitor in the custody officer's home. <laughs> Oof, yeah. And I felt very stuck. And I, I think in my life, that has been the biggest theme of either being stuck in a career or being stuck in a situation. Like I went through fertility treatment for eight years. I felt like I could not make a baby. Uh, so this theme of being stuck has accrued and is, is what I define as my biggest trauma. I do not like being stuck. I'm very reactive to it. And I have this passion to drive and move forward and never have a ceiling over my head. Wow. And when you're dealing with these traumatic uh, experiences that other people have had to deal with in their lives, did you find, especially early on, that this was triggering for you and it was bringing up a lot of stuff that you weren't quite ready to deal with? Oh, yes. I, it was very interesting because as you 
begin in the field of mental health, you don't understand your own mental health. So that's why they really highly recommend you see a therapist right, as you're going through it. Um, but I quickly learned, you know, my impact on my patients and their impact on me. And now I can turn it off. Now I can leave my work in the office and go home. But for years, I would take it home with me. It impacted my relationships, my sleep, uh, my especially when I was working in criminal settings, my sense of safety, I was very aware of the potential for danger all around me. How I imagine every police officer, FBI agent, fireman feels, I I couldn't believe I was feeling that too. My ignorance got thrown out the window. <laughs> yeah, I mean, living in that constant state of hypervigilance is not really all that great for your endocrine system anyway, but oh my gosh, that's putting it on steroids. Yeah, it was. And I, I didn't have the coping skills to deal with it because I was so new in the career. I mean, my first clinical training was in the Los Angeles County Jail, which is one of the most dangerous and erratic facilities known in the world. There were stories that would come out of that facility. I didn't live too far from there for a little while when I was in LA. That was rough. You're always hearing some kind of alarms going off over there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, so, there were many, many riots, tons of violence, and you can't leave. You're in it with everyone else. And the thing about working in these systems is when stuff happens when there's violence you become an officer it doesn't matter if you're a little psychology intern with no training in physical defense it's all hands on deck to protect everyone yeah. and that is a yeah. very vulnerable situation so how did you overcome the lack of having a lot of job opportunities when you first started out well for the first training experience I didn't get paid. I didn't get paid for many years. Or if I did, it was 20,000 for the year. Ouch. Not a lot. <laughs> but I, I told them that they needed training sites and I would tell them all the benefits that could come. So I went to a psychologist at the LA County Jail. They didn't have a training site. And I said, look, this is an incredible place to train. Can I help you put together a program? And of course, initially they were worried about liability. And so I did a lot of research and I showed them other programs in similar settings. And I said, look, let's get a program together and we can even help you with your work. We can make this a benefit for both of us. And the mental health team and the custody officers decided it was a great idea. And we, me and uh, three others who I still talk to, psychologists, were the first to start training there. Um, oh. <laughs> so a lot of my job prospects were a fight, a fight to get. Uh, I'm a young woman. I'm not as well trained as people who have been in my field longer than me. Uh, so I had to really persevere. I was very persistent. Um, when I wanted to leave forensic psychology and I wanted to go work with PTSD and the veterans, I emailed the VA every week for almost four years wow. and said, are there any openings? Can I come over? And eventually I got an email back saying yes. Wow. That is super cool. What does it mean? I know this is something that you're really good at, but what does it mean to set healthy boundaries against toxic people? So this is the, the big part of the book that I, the big reason I wanted to write the book. Um, what I really noticed during COVID was that some people really enjoyed the relational part of COVID. They enjoyed having permission to stay away from people and especially toxic people, people that drained them, people that made them feel bad, just people that led to negative feelings within them or not the best feelings. And what I noticed in my clients is when we started to become more social and COVID was lifted, they jumped back into these relationships without 
keeping those boundaries up. And that's where this idea came from to say, hey, we need to step back. We can't just dive back into this world. We need to be aware of the people around us, what they do to us, how they impact us, and how we show up in their presence as well. And we need to set flexible and appropriate boundaries that are ever-changing so that we can preserve our best self. I love that. And in, love the, that. in the book, I use the word energy a lot, that we can preserve our energy if we set appropriate boundaries that we're reassessing all the time. Very nice. I've had to cut a lot of toxic people out of my life. And I've known several friends of mine that are trying. And this is definitely something that people struggle with in huge ways. Yeah. They, they love these people. These are their family members. These are friends that they've known for the last 20 years, building those boundaries. They, they get a lot of pushback because these people are like, well, you've never had boundaries for me before. So why should that start now? People aren't ready for those boundaries healthy or not. Tell me a little bit about the book itself. Where'd you get the cover idea? And have you got a little bit of it that you'd like to read for us? Yes. Uh, the cover art, we couldn't decide on the cover art. Um, the publisher had this great idea of, of using a hand to pick people out of a group of people. Um, but the book is going to come along with an interactive game on my website. Uh, we're still working on putting it together. I have an incredible software engineer who's having a lot of fun with it. But the idea is that if we can start to define the people around us and we can define how they take our energy or they add to it, then maybe we can actually put that into a game and we can physically move people around and see that external control. So it's a little bit of a way to feel like we have even more control than just our thoughts, just our emotions and our actions. Very cool. I wanted to read uh, just the two opening paragraphs of the book. Mm -hmm. So the, the book is going to be called The Friend Cleanse, uh, and it's a process to take back control of your life. Do you constantly feel drained, not enough energy to get through your day? Are your relationships taking more from you than they're giving you? Then you need to do this friend cleanse. So within the book, you'll discover how to identify people and their energy and then strategically place them around your sphere, which is the online game that we're putting together, based on if they add or subtract from the quality of your life. Your time is precious. Learning how to establish healthy boundaries is crucial and allows you to live a balanced life. So the friend cleanse is this opportunity to pause and say, if I don't have to be in these relationships because of pressure or force, I can stand back and say that this is what I want my life to look like. You can take control of your life by deciding who gets to be in the inner circle by strategically placing people around you. It's an ability that when you let people back into your life after that pause, and that pause can happen any time, you're going to do it with awareness. You're going to be able to decide on how they impact your energy. You'll determine when you want to see them, how frequently, and what type of relationship you want with them. You can assess this whenever you like. And you can do your friend cleanse quarterly or what I recommend is after any significant life event. Very nice. And when are we expecting this book to come out? January, 2024. I'm excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to have to get a copy for my best friend. I want to play the game. So I'm going to get a copy. <laughs> and let's talk a little bit about your own journey of healing and recovery, what helped you to get through everything that you had to get through once you realized that you had trauma back there that you had to deal with? Um, well, I married a psychologist, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I set boundaries. I really set boundaries around work pressure, friend pressure, 
environmental pressures. And I started to wake up every day, every week and say, okay, this is what the week's going to look like. These are the stressors I anticipate. This is how I'm going to preserve my energy. Uh, Pilates has been an amazing way to ground myself and preserve my energy. I don't try and do Pilates very hardcore. I use it in order to be more meditative. That's been healthy. So having consistent exercise. Uh, but then also I go to therapy. I have a wonderful therapist who I trust and I talk to about so much. And I also talk to a lot of my colleagues about how they are getting through what we call vicarious trauma. They're feeling impacted by their clients and their trauma stories. So overall, you know, I have the physical exercise. I have the groundedness that keeps me feeling like myself. And I talk to people about the trauma. I'm always educating myself and sharing my story and talking to others. And other people have amazing insights that help me process it. That's amazing. I, I love that we're talking about how a therapist will see a therapist. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, I've never met a therapist who didn't have a therapist. Yeah. I've met very few that ever been married to one, uh, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's really important for people to also understand that if they don't trust the therapist that they're with, if they don't get along with the therapist they're with, they need to go out and find somebody that they can work with. A lot of people are afraid to do this though. Do therapists take it personally when somebody decides that you're not the right therapist for me, I need to go find somebody who is? No, I don't think so. Um, and I would hope not because then I think they would need a little more training. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's it's just like any type of relationship, a friendship or dating, you need to make sure that there's a good fit. Right. And you need to put your expectations out there right away. And, you know, what I find is that teenagers are actually the best at doing that with me. They will come in and so confidently say, look, I want a therapist who does this, that and the other. These are my expectations. Can you meet that? And it's amazing because when I, when I have somebody who's around 40 coming in, they just kind of sit there and they let me guide and I have to encourage them to say, okay, what are you looking for? What are our goals? What are we doing with this time? But teenagers are great right now at speaking up for what they want and what their needs are. I think we can learn a lot from how they approach it. <laughs> uh, but I love the transparency and the authenticity that comes with therapy. And I think it needs to be on both sides, the therapist and the client. And if things aren't a good fit, then the therapist is ethically obligated to find you somebody who's going to fit with you so that you can continue to work on whatever it is you're there to work on. Yeah. How often do you hear horror stories from somebody comes in to see you? And, oh, I had this therapist. It was just terrible. And they don't trust you right out of the gate because of what somebody else has done. Is that a common thing? It's a very common thing in my clinical practice. And it's actually a very com common thing in my forensic practice where therapists are sued because of breaking ethics. Mm. And so I will evaluate the clients, the plaintiff who is suing uh, for emotional damages. And I will evaluate if their claims are valid and reflect back on the relationship with the therapist and everything that that went down. And then I will offer the legal teams my, my view and my input based on psychological testing. So there is, um, there's a significant impact of, of a therapist on a client. Even if it doesn't get to the point of lit litigation, it needs to be something that we go into thoughtfully with our boundaries and aware. I love that we're having this talk. Seriously. I mean, you probably hear horror stories all the time. In 2019, I had the bottom drop out from under me. I found out some pretty terrible stuff and I needed to go see a therapist. And the first one that I went to go see was terrible. And she ended up, I traumatized her 
so much that she ended up leaving the practice. She was pretty new. Oh, wow. And I felt a lot of guilt for that. I was a survivor of human trafficking. I had already been through so much stuff. And what Mm -hmm. I needed right then was somebody that I could just weep to. I had all this toxic poison in me and I needed to get it out of me. And she was there. Mm -hmm. But then they paired me up with another therapist who was somebody who had already worked with other survivors of trafficking. So she knew what she was getting into. She was trauma informed. She was practiced in this and she took it and she helped me tremendously. I, I have to ask, how important is it that people seek out a therapist who knows how to handle what their specific needs are? Incredibly, incredibly important. I mean, you might have a brand new therapist in the field, but they may be really good at the specific need that needs to be met. Uh, or you may want somebody who's more seasoned, but maybe they've never worked with trafficking. What I find is I work really well with trauma and I work really well with first responders, being a first responder myself. Um, and I work really well with their families. A fireman has a crazy schedule. I can really work well with his wife and we can figure it out. But that needs to be something that's discussed. What the therapist is competent in and capable of tolerating. In my career, I've heard probably some of the worst stories that exist. And I've always had the ability to hold the story and be in the story with the client and empathize and be present. And a lot of people can't tolerate it. It's so, hard. I mean, you're I've, absorbing it all. You're absorbing it all, right? I mean, I've sat with cannibals. I've sat with serial killers. I've dug into what exactly brought them pleasure in that moment to assess what kind of threat they are going to be in the future. And, you know, I, and at the time I didn't even get Botox. So it was just, <laughs> it was just able to be there with them. I found it interesting. I, they, they are human beings at the end of the day. And how did they become this way? I wanted to figure it out with them. Even if it meant my reports would lead to them being in prison for the rest of their lives, we were still in it together. <laughs> Well, and that's such important work. We need to know who needs to stay in prison for the rest of their lives. And we need to know who has a shot at making it on the outside. Yeah. I love what you're doing. I think you are just such an awesome person. Ah, you're just so cool. So Dr. Leslie, is it okay if I doc- call you Dr. Leslie? Can you call me Leslie? Okay. <laughs> Have you always been an introvert or an extrovert? And do you feel like that's changed throughout your life at all? Oh, it's definitely changed. I think I was way more extroverted uh, when I was more ignorant and unaware of the world. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I have to be more introverted now because I only have so much energy to give. And people deserve my energy in my clinical practice. And I don't want to give it away to overly social situations that don't deserve it. So I focus my energy on my kids, my husband, a few close friends, and I bring people into my practice and decide on what time I'm going to see them depending on my energy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that's that's my priority and my focus. And if I know there's a big event coming up, I move things around so that I can really maintain being an ethical and strong psychologist for my clients. How do you celebrate your wins in life when something goes really well? It's not the best habit, but I <laughs> love online shopping. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Oh, sisters at the heart. <laughs> I really love, um, I really love consignment shopping and, or vintage shopping. Mm. So I will, even if it's online, really digging out, you know, an old, uh, 
Gucci purse that I've been in love with and finding it, <laughs> even if it's broken and disheveled and then getting it fixed. Um, but I love having that distraction of just zoning out from the world and looking at a project of even a even a beautiful purse that I'm imagining getting. Uh, but I also love, I play with my kids a lot and, you know, I try and find their games not so boring. I try to get into playing Barbies. <laughs> <laughs> I never could even as a kid. I don't know how you do it. More power to you, man. I'm going to do something I never do. I'm going to turn off my background image here for a second. Over here in the corner, I have a dress from 1947. Oh, so I love it. The whole vintage thing is totally my thing too. And here's a 1939 radio. Oh my gosh. So yeah, the whole vintage shopping thing. That's, that's my little celebration also. Can't help it. <laughs> yes. It's such a great distraction too. And it's, it's this inspiring search that is meaningful. Yeah. And you find exactly the right thing. That's mm -hmm. a celebration yeah. in itself that deserves to be celebrated. Let me go buy a pair of shoes now. <laughs> so is that time for my last question? It's my most favorite question because everybody answers differently depending on how they're feeling in this exact moment. So what is one thing that you truly love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? Ooh, okay. Um, I love that... I can tap into the strength within me whenever I need to. And I love that my vulnerable side is there with my children and my family and when I need to with clients. But when I am under attack, like in trial or testimony, I can find this clear inner strength to bring the story forward that I need to and cut off the vulnerability at that time. So I love my ability to switch back and forth depending on the needs of life. And it's been a skill I've, I've really had to hone. <laughs> 